Hi, I'm Peter Suber. I'm the director of the Harvard Office for Scholarly Communication, which is based in the library, and the director of the Harvard Open Access Project, which is based at the Berkman Center. I work to foster open access within Harvard and beyond Harvard. Uh, within Harvard, I'm working with the Office for Scholarly Communication to provide open access to new research published by faculty, and longer term, published by graduate students, research fellows. Uh, we focus on open access to research articles, peer-reviewed research articles by faculty, but we also want open access to dissertations, uh, to books, book chapters, data sets, conference presentations, uh, any kind of research that is produced by people at Harvard. And then beyond Harvard, I work to develop open access policies at other institutions. Some of them are universities, but I also help publishers, societies, uh, governments, and projects of all kinds to think about converting to open access, supporting open access, or adopting open access policies. Open access literature is digital, online, free of charge, and free of most copyright and licensing restrictions. Basically, it's freely available. But scholars are not paid for their journal articles. That creates this wonderful opportunity that doesn't exist for almost any other kind of creative work. Scholars will not be deprived of revenue if they make their work open. Uh, for centuries, they've been writing research articles for impact, not for money. But they've never gotten the impact they could have had because there was no internet. There was just print. And print uh, is expensive, and it reaches a limited audience. Open access is an attempt to take advantage of this opportunity, where you have these people writing useful and valuable literature for impact, not for money, who want to reach the widest possible audience, and who now suddenly have the technology to reach a worldwide audience at essentially no marginal cost. So we want to do that. We want to put those two things together. The benefit for authors is that open access gives them the largest possible audience. It makes their work available to everybody who can use their work, build on their work, apply their work, or make any use of their work. Whether those people are fellow academics or not, everybody who could make any use of it suddenly has access to it. That increases the author's impact. It increases the usefulness of their work. Open access benefits readers by letting them discover and then retrieve everything they want to read. Uh, now, it's generally easy to discover new work, but very often when you try to retrieve it, you hit a paywall. And you can't afford to pay. Even scholars can't afford to pay. Even universities can't afford to pay to provide access to all relevant work for their faculty and students. Even the wealthiest universities in the world can't afford to provide access to everything for their faculty and students. Harvard cancels subscription journals every year for budgetary reasons alone. So another part of the rationale is that nobody, even at the wealthiest university in the world, has access to all the research relevant to their own work. Uh, the more open access we can provide, the more we solve that problem. At the same time, we're serving authors and readers uh, throughout the world in every field, in every language. If they're publishing scholars, they can participate by making their own work open. They can publish in an open access journal, or they can publish in a conventional journal and deposit a copy of their peer-reviewed manuscript in an open access repository. If they're students, they can do the same thing for their work now. They can do the same thing for their future work when they're scholars, if they become scholars. They can persuade their faculty members to make their work open access. And many faculty, in fact, were introduced to open access or uh, saved from misunderstandings about open access through their students. Faculty and students can help their universities adopt open access policies, which help spread this to all the faculty in the institution, and not just the few who have already uh, made the steps themselves. Some of the strongest and most effective open access policies are at the government level. And this means that all citizens and all voters can help the cause by persuading their legislators to adopt a good open access policy. The principle is publicly funded research that's not classified should be made freely available to the public. This argument appeals to liberals and conservatives, and we found it appeals to liberals and conservatives in every country. It's not culture bound, it's not economy bound. Everybody seems to support this argument. Policymakers get it right away, even if they don't otherwise follow the fortunes of publicly funded research. So I urge all voters who want open access to let their legislators know that they want it. Legislators will understand the argument, even if they've never heard it before, and they will register the fact that here's one more voter who cares.
Well, first of all, we're making steady progress on all the important fronts. So I see more of the same. But more of the same on all the important fronts means success. We get more open access journals every week, every month. We get more open access repositories every week, every month. We get more deposits into the open access repositories every week, every month. We get more open access policies at universities and funding agencies every month. And I think, finally, the most important front is we get better understanding of open access from the stakeholders, especially publishing scholars, uh, every month. When you're making progress on all those fronts for long enough, then suddenly open access has become the default for all new research. To me, that's the most important short-term goal. Some people say the most important goal is 100% open access to all new work. That's a long-term goal, and I think we'll approach it asymptotically at best. <clears throat> Uh, right now, it looks like between 20 and 50 percent of all new work is open access from birth. That's a good number, especially compared to five or ten years ago. I expect it'll keep growing, but when it reaches 80 or 90 percent, the curve will start to flatten out, and it'll approach 100 percent as an asymptote. And if we hold out for 100 percent, we might hold out for a century. Moreover, a lot of work can be open access and subscription-based, or toll access, at the same time. Uh, that's true even today. So I don't want to stop toll access from existing or subscription publishing from existing. I just want to increase the portion that's also open. And the most important threshold in measuring our progress is whether open access has become the default for all new research. And I think we're just about there. This video was produced by the Office for Scholarly Communication, a program of the Harvard Library.